couple of decades ago, a fine fella called me one Sunday afternoon and he asked if I could meet him for breakfast on Monday morning. During breakfast, he said, let me tell you why I needed to talk to you. Yesterday morning, he said, we were on the way from our house to the church building and our daughter from the back seat asked a question and I did not know how to answer. I said, imagine a middle school girl asking a question that a dad didn't know how to answer. He said, well, called his wife's name. She didn't know what to say either. I said, okay. So what was her question? Her question was this. Didn't Jesus live like about 2,000 years ago? Why are we still studying what he said? Hasn't anyone said anything in this scientific age that could draw us closer to God? And I looked at him across the table. I leaned toward him over our eggs and bacon and I asked, and you didn't know how to answer that? No. And I said, let's talk. If you were that girl's parents, how would you have answered that question? In Matthew 11, there is a wonderful story. John, the baptizer, has been arrested. He is in prison. And he sends some of his disciples, some of the folks that have been following him, he sends them to find Jesus with a question. And his question is this. Are you the one we should be looking for or should we wait for another? In other words, John the baptizer, who's been prophesying about Jesus coming, John the baptizer who baptizes Jesus in River Jordan, John the baptizer who encourages his disciples to become followers of Jesus, John the baptizer now behind prison bars has a question. Uh, I ain't here for nothing, am I? Are you the one or have I gotten this wrong? The one who John had said at the river about Jesus, I am not even worthy to untie his sandals, now asks that very person, are you the one we should be listening to and following? Are you the one or are you just on a short list? Well, as you may have heard, there's a lot of change going on in today's world. Change is in every spectrum of culture, society, globally and locally. There's change going on. And the church with a capital C is influenced by these changes. The church with a little c, local congregations, are being affected too. Many of these changes are good and will be very good. However, I propose to you there is one aspect of church that must not change. It is this. People who claim they have committed their lives to follow Jesus, his teachings, his lifestyle principles, need to re-up on his teachings. Otherwise, a local church will be a church in name only and will follow this world to hell in a handbasket. What makes St. John's a church is not the name on our sign out here at the corner of Hawthorne at 5th. What makes St. John's a church is following Jesus and doing God's work. I like the cotton patch version of the New Testament translated by the Reverend Dr. Clarence Jordan. Some of you have heard me quote or read from this translation before. 
What you may not know, some of you, is who Clarence Jordan was. You may have heard of Habitat for Humanity. Uh, you may have heard of the Southern Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. Both of those were inspired because those two founders went and spent some time with Clarence Jordan at Koinonia Farm in South Georgia. What you may not know is that Clarence Jordan became concerned about the impoverished, and so he went back home, so to speak, to South Georgia. After he finished his master's and his doctorate at seminary, he returned home to South Georgia where he and his wife founded a farm, Koinonia Farm, and there they worked not only in helping the poor, and especially the African-American poor, but the poor white folks as well, and he helped them learn how they could have better housing. And they explored ways of trying to help affordable housing be constructed for the poor. But he was very, very outspoken about racism should no longer prevail in South Georgia, to the point that his house was bombed and they were shot at at night, and you can imagine he and his wife and children down on the floor, staying away from the bullets, piercing the house. Clarence took the New Testament and brought it over into what we call the cotton patch language. So we read this morning with Kim these two passages. We're familiar with them now, re-familiar with them. Let me read you how Clarence Jordan brings this over so we might be able to hear it and understand it anew. Luke chapter 12. Now somebody in the crowd said to Jesus, Hey preacher, speak to my brother about dividing the inheritance with me. And Jesus said to him, well, I say now, fellow, who appointed me to be a judge or an arbitrator between you two brothers? And then Jesus said to all of them, you all be careful. You stay on your guard against all kinds of greediness, for a person's life is not about piling up possessions. And then he gave him this comparison story. You know, it was a certain rich fellow's farm producing really well, and he held a meeting with himself. And he said, now what am I going to do? I don't have enough room to store all of my crops. And then he said, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my old barns. I'll build some bigger barns. And then there I'll store all of my wheat and all of my produce, and I will say to myself, self, you've got enough now, stuffed away, stashed away, to do you a long time. Recline, dine, wine, and shine. But God said to him, you nitwit, at this very moment, your goods are putting the screws on your soul. All these things you've grubbed for, to whom shall they really belong? That's the way it is with a man who piles up stuff for himself without giving God a thought. You should know that Clarence Jordan was a Greek scholar. He didn't translate into cotton patch from the living Bible or even the King Jimmy. He went directly to the Greek text and brought it over into how it would apply in Southern culture. In Luke chapter 19, he entered and passed through Hampton. And now a man was there by the name of Zeke Gears. He was a district director of the revenue service and quite well off. He was trying to get a glimpse of Jesus to see what he looked like. He had heard about him but never seen him. But he couldn't see him very well because of the crowd. You see, Zeke was a short man. So he ran on ahead of the crowd and climbed up a pecan tree so he could spot him when he came by. Jesus was about to pass, and Jesus got under that very tree. He looked up and he said, hey, Zeke Gears, hurry up and come down here because I need to stay at your house today. 
And Mr. Gears slid down right away and gladly took him home with him. And when the good white people saw all of this, they grumbled. He is going home to dinner with a man who doesn't even belong to the church. And during the meal, Mr. Gears got up and he said to his master, Look, half of what I own, sir, I'm going to give to the poor. And if I have, uh, uh, if I have, if I have cheated anyone, I'll pay back four times that amount. And Jesus said to him, Today, new life has arrived at this house because after all, he too is a white man and he's the son of man has come to search out and rescue anybody who gets off track. It's important that you hear what Jesus says about money because you've committed your lives to follow Jesus the teachings of Jesus. Jesus taught, you should guard yourself against greediness and you should guard against storing up stuff for yourself without giving God's work a serious thought. And after his afternoon visit with Zacchaeus, Jesus said, you show evidence that God is making you into a new person by how you are using your financial gifts to do God's work. You see, Jesus' teachings about money were not really about money as an economic, tangible thing. Jesus wasn't really teaching about money as if it was about finances. Jesus was teaching about the spiritual power of money. Jesus referred to money in 11 of his 39 parables. He spoke about money more than he spoke about salvation or prayer. But Jesus used money as a subject to talk about because he was trying to challenge you and me in our commitment. Jesus came to reveal the way of God and when you obey the way of Jesus, you obey the way of God. Here is a truth you might consider internalizing. In this banking city, one of the wealthiest financial centers in this nation, one of the largest economic powers in this nation, thereby in the world, St. John's has plenty of resources to accomplish whatever you choose to do or be. The problem is it's in your pockets. It's not already in the church's accounts. That's the challenge. Our converged task force and our financial leaders are bringing forward realistic and visionary plans for St. John's future. So I must say this to you on this Sunday before Commitment Sunday. My last stewardship season to challenge you in your financial stewardship and all God's people said it's about time. You need to listen to what Jesus says about money. To help you listen to Jesus, here are a few of his words again in cotton patch language. Jesus said, it is impossible for a person to serve two masters. You will love one of them more than the other. You will have respect for one and contempt for the other. It is impossible for you to be fastened off tightly to both God and money. You're familiar with Luke 12 verse 34 which quotes Jesus as saying, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Clarence Jordan simplifies this by saying, your treasure and your heart are wrapped up together. Here's the Faust version. Make God's work your heart's treasure. What Jesus is really teaching you here is that money 
is competing for your heart. Money is competing for your heart. Jesus is not just on a short list of the top three to five folks you should listen to. Jesus is Lord. You're a generous people. You use your gifts to do God's work in many ways. Next year, like every other year, you will have an opportunity and a challenge. Your biggest challenge will be responding to the honest question of a middle school girl. Why are you still doing what Jesus said 2,000 years ago? My prayer is that your answer will be something like this. I study Jesus because he is Lord of my faith. When I learn and when I obey Jesus' teachings, when I follow Jesus, I know I am doing God's work. Decades ago, on a hot Sunday evening, a pastor was leading a Bible study on a Wednesday night. It was a hot night, and if you can imagine it, here in North Carolina, the air conditioning system in that particular church building was not working right. And so they had opened all the windows and the doors to Fellowship Hall. It so happened that the fellowship hall doors looked right over to the parsonage next door. On the front porch of the parsonage was the family's dog, the pastor's dog, named Oakley. Oakley listened to them sing a couple of songs. He listened to someone offer a prayer. And then it came time for the Bible study to begin. And Oakley lifted his head. He heard a familiar voice. It was the pastor now beginning to speak to lead the Bible study. Oakley sat up and started walking and walked right through the door of Fellowship Hall up to the little platform and just sat down beside the pastor. A family friend quickly rose and went up and grabbed Oakley's collar and led him out back out the door and pointed over to the parsonage porch, go. But before that fellow could get back to his seat, Oakley was right back through the door, right back up. This time, he didn't just sit down by the pastor, he laid down, rested his, paw, rested his head on his paws. Everyone started laughing. And then the pastor good pastor, always taking advantage of a teachable moment. The pastor looked at the people once they stopped laughing and said, Oakley has come in here tonight because he heard the voice of his master. What about you?